What's up, everybody? Welcome to another edition of Our Kids Play Hockey. You got a guest this week, Mark Gilman, who's a hockey lifer. He has coached his kids. He's been involved with hockey from house league all the way to uh, college baseball with his kids. It was a great conversation about what we can do better as parents and coaches to really impact the lives of these youth athletes. Um, it's one of those ones you're going to want to listen to. You're probably going to have a lot of thoughts. And if you have anything you want to say to us, make sure you contact us on social media or at uh, team at ourkidsplayhockey.com. And also make sure it's out now. When Hockey Stops, the new children's book that Christy and I wrote, it's getting out there. Lots of awesome endorsements. Kids are loving it. Uh, you can get an early access edition at www.whenhockeystops.com with some free gifts. If uh, you want to support the show, it's a great way to do it. So check that out. And also, if you like what you're hearing, if you love this show, make sure to like, subscribe, love, whatever emoji or thing you have to press on whatever you do to listen to this show. We appreciate it, uh, reviewing everything. So thanks so much. Without further ado, here's Our Kids Play Hockey with Mark Gill. Hello, hockey friends and families around the world, and welcome to another edition of Our Kids Play Hockey. I'm Lee Elias, and I'm joined, as always, by my good friends Mike Benelli and Christy Casciano-Burns, and we are joined today by an incredibly experienced hockey parent and person. He is the owner of Pitch Noise Strategic Communications and the former owner and general manager of the Motor City Hockey Club and a director with the Michigan Amateur Hockey Association, Mark Gilman. Mark has four boys who played hockey from house to juniors, with two of them eventually becoming collegiate baseball players. And he is now back into hockey again after owning a junior A team and spending two years in Guatemala by helping to run the Greenville Hockey Association in South Carolina today. Mark, it's a pleasure to have you here with us today. Welcome to Our Kids Play Hockey. Thank you. It's really a pleasure. Yeah, no, the pleasure's all ours. And uh, look, we're going to jump right into it. Uh, Christy wanted you to come on the show. As soon as we heard about it, we were excited about it. You're a talented writer. Uh, a lot of hockey parents would regularly turn to your hockey blog for great guidance and perspective. Uh, and again, that's how Christy met you, because in her book, My Kids Play Hockey, which also happens to be uh, the, the guide for this show, um, you were a contributor in that book. And, and it was the uh, segment called I Have Met the Enemy and He Is Us. Your kid is not an investment. Uh, you know, it's funny, Christy, I was flipping through the book the other day and I saw that before this interview was scheduled and I made a mental note. This really happened to like, oh, let me read that chapter. And, and there you go, reading my mind, bring the guy on to talk about it. So, so let, let's just talk about that first, uh, Mark, because again, we're heading into the off season here. Um, parents are now, their wallets are empty. <laughs> the wallets are empty. They've spent all and the money. And they're gassed. Yeah, they're gassed. They're tired. We're, we're at that point. All the parents are going, I don't know if I want to do this again next season, which, you know, in August, that'll change. But talk to me about that, that, that little, uh, you know, segment you wrote in the book and, and what you meant by that. Well, you know, what's really bad is when you, when you are recruiting for like a junior team or a triple a AAA or travel team, whatever. And you feel like the first step you have to take is to see how they're dressed and if they can afford it. Um, that's a problem. Um, you know, a lot of people have, I think if, if I talk to any parent that I have, our kids have grown up together with and what have you, and, you know, I would, they would all say the same thing. If I could do it all over again, I would spend less money. Right. And, and I, I'm certainly in that camp. Uh, I, th I think we feel like getting specialized coaches, specialized training, extra ice uh, is going to make our kids uh, part of our investment in, in getting them a college scholarship. I'll tell you my situation. Um, I spent a lot of money. My youngest son was the best hockey player in the family. Um, he was phenomenal and got burned out. And um, his teammates, he had three teammates on the University of Massachusetts um, national wow. championship team last year, three wow. teammates. And so that's the level he used to play at. And he just, he just burned out and he had a bunch of concussions. And so the whole investment was, we're going to get a college scholarship out of this. So his senior year, he says, you know what? I can't do this anymore. I'm, I'm sick. He's broken every bone in his body. He's hurt. He's had concussions. He's done. So all that money, which was supposed to save money on college, is now gone. He had four offers. And he said, I can't do this, Dad. I just, wow. I just can't. And I didn't argue with him. I mean, it's just, it was just sad. But I think, you know, we're sending eight-year-olds to summer camps and summer stick handling training. And I, it's, it's crazy. I, I just, it, it, it's funny. You know, I, I just moved to South Carolina. And it's a different it's different down here. I mean, people aren't in the hockey universe like they are in other parts of the country. Although most of the kids in hockey in Carolina are from other places. 
So, you know, they're from Canada, they're from Buffalo, they're from Boston, they're, I mean, they're, they're from all over the country, but still it's a different mindset here. They don't have the specialized coaching. They don't have a, uh, and I don't need to disparage any spe specific countries, but they don't have a Czech coach or a Russian coach that walks in and says, hey, I can train your kid. You know, it's only going to cost you 6,000 a year. Um, it's, it's just, it's ridiculous the amount of money we spend on this stuff. And I think if you take a look back and you think about all the money you could have, if you didn't spend that kind of money, it would be, it would be a real blessing to a lot of people. Yeah. Cause I, I think, you know, parents get caught up it, as you talked about, you're kind of in that culture where everyone around you is doing it. So you mm -hmm. feel as if, well, if I don't do this, my kid's not going to have that. We can't, we have to chase that golden puck. Because if I don't, then my kid's dream's not going to come true. Is it your kid's dream or is it your dream, right? My favorite, my favorite one is when you when you get the you get a phone call and you find out that three of your kids' teammates are going on a tour of Sweden next summer. You know, <laughs> like that, like they're going to get so much better. It's a, it's a it's a money grab. There's there's no benefit for other. If you want to take your kid to Sweden, take him to Sweden. Don't make him play hockey when he's there. You know, I, I just, it's, 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 there's so many different money grabs and there are different people and there's, there's tournaments that are not needed. There's specialized uh, select teams that they have that play in the off season or over the holidays. If you don't make it, then you're probably never going to do anything in hockey the rest of your life. And I'm talking about select eight year old teams. You know, this is, I mean, Christy, I've told you this before. I, if, if I could do anything, I would get every parent of an eight year old in a room and I would tell them your kid is not going to the NHL. Okay. It's, it's not going to happen. Calm down, put your stopwatch away. Stop, stop to keep in track of your kid's ice time, leave the coaches alone, let them coach. He's not going to the NHL or she's not going to the NHL either, either one. And it's just, it's, that seems to be the troublesome age <laughs> that I've had over the years. It's like, it's everything is so, I was watching some eight-year-olds play the other day and I went, they're so cute. I used to take this so seriously. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I saw that recently in an AU tournament where the parents weren't really enjoying it. They were really caught up in the competitiveness of it and how competitive the other teams were and how that team played dirty. <laughs> it's like they're eight. Come on. And then you've got the one parent at the glass that's always saying, move your feet. Move like, your feet. Stop. Yeah, I'll say this too. I, I'm an 8U coach right now. And Mark, just quickly, because we just met my background. Is I, I coached professionally for a long time. So 8U, this is my first experience in youth hockey as a coach. My son's on the team. And uh, it, Christy and Mike, you'll laugh about this. I feel, you know, we're kind of through the season now. So I feel like I'm, I'm kind of like, I was a rookie in the beginning and I'm all bandaged up. My eyes are dripping. I got the darkness under my eye. Yeah, I, I made it. I've made it through the season. But before I comment on that, I want to throw it to Mike. Mike, I know you probably got stuff to, to comment on this as well. Yeah, it's just it's uh, so so I, I so Mark, like I've been so jaded by this. Right. And, and the podcast has not helped. I can tell you that because it's just because anybody that's listening to this podcast and the reason it came about was for that very reason that you don't know until you're a parent of an 18 and 19 year old what these issues are. And it, it's just so sad because we miss out on the opportunity to to educate and listen because just like you said, you were that parent, you were that dad. And I see that. And I've, I've been doing this for what, 30 some seven years, you know, building rinks everywhere and, and, and programs and charging crazy amounts of money and offering spring and summer select teams. And I get it, but because there is, there's a lot, there's a money grab, no doubt, but every parent thinks like when you go in that room of eight-year-olds and eight-year-old, you know, parents, and you say, none of your kids are going to make it to the NHL. The, the only one the, everybody in the room looks and goes yeah well not that kid he ain't gonna make it. but but my you know but my kid is like so does everybody in that room thinks it's their kid like if you went like we've talked about this before even with lee you know lee is like okay you're in the room and you have 25 parents and you say you know the percentages of all you know any of you making it are so small blah 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 and then but everybody in the room thinks they're in a small percentage and what happens is they can't get out of their own way of just saying god will give you the ability to play at a higher level it's not going to be you know sergey's power skating class for the next 25 weeks it's going to be your talent and your drive and your passion and your you you know you as an individual and i think our job as parents 
and coaches and administrators is to just provide all those tools and resources in there. And hopefully the kids kind of can navigate through, you know, without at the end of the day, like you're saying, burning out and just, you know, wondering, wow, where was that ROI? Like I did all of this for my son just to say, okay, well, that was fun. <laughs> I'm out. And, you know, I, I just think, I, I, I just think we should all, I mean, if we, maybe if we did a better job of having better parent calculators, you know, with people like you, you know, you going in the room of a group of parents saying, I'm going to give you my story. You could believe it or not. You could take it and, and, and do what you want with the information I'm going to give you. But the fact is that we're going to, I just think, I think the, I think the genie's out of the bottle here. And I think it, this is only going to get worse. Let me give yeah. you, let me give you, let me give you an example. So I, I, I have this kid, I'm going to, I'm going to name him. His name is Trevor Bodie. He is the funny, one of the funniest kids I've ever met. No one could sell you like that kid. I mean, he was the <laughs> king of selling. I remember one time I was on the bench and he came over and we we're playing juniors and he said, Hey, Mark, did you see that goal? And I said, Trevor, everybody saw that goal. You know, so you, you, you made sure everyone did. But anyway, this kid was playing house when we picked him. He was playing house his whole life. He'd never played travel. I mean, he's playing house. Yeah. So my coach comes up to me and he says, Hey, I found this kid. He's playing. Um, he's, he's six, he's 16 years old. He's playing, playing in a house league. I said, why are we looking at house kids? You know, what, what are we, what are we doing? He says, wait, do you see him? So he comes in, the kid was flipping phenomenal. And the problem was his parents went through a divorce. They didn't have any money. They had all sorts of things happened with, he was sick for a couple of years because they found black mold in his house. I mean, all these things that happened to this kid to keep him in house. By the time he was done, not only did he set our team record for goals in, in a, in a career, he set the division three record last year. And so this is a house kid, you know, who's just a phenomenal hockey player. And think about all the money that could have been spent on that kid to make him a better player. You know? <laughs> yeah. No, and, I, and, and I think, and I think to your point, time, I mean, forget about money because, because obviously the, the sport of hockey is becoming it, it's, you know, and, and it's funny this week, I think is uh, tomorrow is actually, you know, this is a whole USA hockey week. We're doing this, this, um, uh, podcast on this week and and one of the days is you know hockey is for everyone and diversity and outreach and and the fact is no matter what we do as a hockey community we are out pacing the ability for anybody to play hockey it's too expensive for people to think because there's not enough people mark like you thinking well why can't you just develop in a house league if you're and and, and why is that like a like why is that such a negative thing like why is the negative connotation that if you're just having fun and enjoying at a game and getting better and, and, and creating your own passion and environment. Why is that bad? Like, why do I need to create your passion? Like you're the kid. Yeah. And I Let think me, that's, this, this is such a huge piece because of just what you said. And, and I, and that those stories aren't out there. The sto Cause I think there's more of those than not. I think there's more kids that played 12, you know, 13, 14 years old playing on a teams and B teams and driving to get to that level then the then we, saw, we saw an olympic we saw an olympic situation um a couple of weeks ago I, I can't remember her name the woman who won the speed skating she started skating four years before she won the gold medal four right. years i had a kid on, my, on one of my teams that was also a speed skater and his dad was psychotic about speed skating he didn't care about hockey he it was all about speed skating he had private coaches he had all these he traveled all over the country blah 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 this woman was the gold medal and she started skating four years before the olympics you know, you either have talent or you don't, you know, it just, it's, it's a, it's a problem. I, I would, I would love to be at a point where house doesn't have a stigma. You know, I think house hockey and, and something like the Carol in the Carolinas, there's not that stigma. You know, they're playing house. They're having fun. You're in Michigan. You're playing house. You're not very good. You go to school and you hear about it. No, you're not good. You just play house. Don't talk to me about hockey. You're a house player. You know, it doesn't matter. And it's, we've got to get rid of that stigma. And it, one of the things that I, br I brought up in, in one of my articles, and Christy, you know this, is that I have this, I have this real problem with the fact that we breaking up our kids. When I grew up playing hockey, I played with all the kids in my community. We played on the same team. We grew up together. Now kids are jumping travel teams every year and they're, they have three rinks within 10 minutes of their house, but they're driving two hours away because this is the, the premier team. And we're breaking up friendships and families. And 
It's, 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 I remember, um, I was talking to my son actually two days ago and I said, there's a kid playing down here, playing juniors down here that you went to high school with. He goes, yeah, he's really good. I said, how come he never played for your high school? He said, he just didn't feel the need to, you know, he wanted, his parents wanted him to travel across the country. So it's a kid from Michigan who was playing in the Carolinas, but he could have played, he could have played, you know, with his buddies in high school. You know, it's just, I don't, I don't like what's happened. It's just, it's, it's, yeah. it's just split. It's, we don't have friendships anymore. Right. And um, my daughter played high school hockey and they won a state championship. Uh, such treasured memories. If you ask her, and she's playing college hockey now, but if you ask her, what's your favorite year of all? Oh, when we won the state championship with my friends yep. in high school, it yep. wasn't the uh, AAA championship that they won. It was that high school hockey tournament. That was the most treasured memory so far that she's had. Yeah, and I also want to say there's a lot to be said for unstructured creativity with our kids. And I think, especially now in the downtime, a lot of parents are thinking about the clinics and what structured environment should I put my kid in now that the hockey season has ended. But there's a lot to be said for just letting the kids maybe do nothing or you know do something that's not that's non-committal. You know, I was talking to Roger Grillo from USA Hockey the other day, and he made a great analogy. He said, look at guitar great Jimi Hendrix. He never had any guitar lessons when he started out. And if he had, he probably would have been yelled at for turning the guitar upside down and playing it backwards. But because he had that freedom of being creative, he became one of the greatest guitar players. We've, he changed the course of rock history. So, I, and I think, and, and Mark, to your point, letting the kids just enjoy themselves, enjoy their friends, and have some time where they can be kids, where we can just step back and, you know, just let them have some fun. At, the, good thing, eight, the good thing is, nine. yeah, the good thing is if you're in a cold area, they're still playing hockey on the pond. You know, that, exactly. hasn't, yeah. that hasn't stopped. You know, right. they're, still, they're still playing hockey on the pond. But... Other than that, they don't see each other. They just, they just don't. You know, I want to, I want to dive in here, guys. I, I've been taking notes because there's so much you want to say right now. Uh, as a parent of an eight-year-old. <laughs> well, here's the deal. You know, I have this unique, I've had a unique road in the game, right? I, so, so Mark, to your point, I started when I was 12, uh, very late, and I, I moved up the ranks very quickly. But I had the passion for it. I had the drive for it, and I had, I had the right mentors at the time. Um, but you know, I want to rewind back a little bit, Mike, you talked about the ROI on all this money spent. And I think the key here is that, and, and don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that it had to be this much money, but the ROI on any time your child is involved in youth sports is the life lessons they're going to grow. And I think that that is the thing that we are missing the most right now in the sports community, because this conversation isn't just limited to hockey. Now, from a financial aspect, hockey is by far the worst. I, it, there's no doubt. But I've seen this in youth football, basketball. Hey, my kid's going all the way. Baseball, seen it. volleyball, e everything. everything. And, and yeah. here's the truth. We're talking about how does this change? Where does it change? Parents, coaches, we have to come back down to earth. I'll never tell a kid if his dream is to make the pros or her dream is to make the pros. I will never tell a kid that they can't make it. But but the point is, is that they have to put the time and they have to have the drive. They have to have the character. They have the right to pursue the dream, even if they don't make it. But we're missing the life lessons. The value of the youth sports your kid is involved in, as Christy said, is the friends they make, the adversity they face, the life lessons they can learn. I can tell you right now with my 8U team, all right, I've been around the game long enough. I've played long enough. I've coached long enough to know I, I got a special team here in terms of all the parents get along, the coaching staff gets along, the kids get along. It's very rare even though it's my first time coaching at this age, I know this is a rarity, right? What did we focus on this year? Team building, that it's supposed to be fun over winning. We try not to keep score. We ask them not to put the score on the scoreboard. And I'm sure people think, well, you think you're going to kill us? You think we're going to kill you? I don't care. My, my favorite games this year were the ones I didn't know the score, but the games were competitive, right? You know, when I look at youth hockey guys, uh, I've always said this, you know, I kind of divide it in my head, you know, the kind of six U. Uh, to, to, to 12 you is a phase, right? That's when you build character, love for the game, fundamental skill sets. This isn't about becoming a superstar yet. All right. If, if there's a standout at this age, you'll know, <laughs> you'll know, right. Then I would say there's that 12 to 15 area that the U12, U15, where, you know, that's pubescent kids got to figure out what they want at that age. You become serious or you don't. 
right? About, okay, I really love this game. I really want to pursue it. Or, hey, I want to pursue other things, which is also okay. And then the U15, the U18, that's where you start to make decisions on, okay, should I be maybe investing time and money and resources into a potential future for this game, which, which as you said, Mark, is extremely unlikely. And you have to have that conversation of, do you want to pursue it knowing the possible outcome, the likely outcome is that you will not make it, but you have the right to pursue that. You know, the other thing too, Christy, you said Jimi Hendrix. You know, I, I don't remember if there's a picture or a video, but I always remember Jimi Hed Hendrix. Uh, he wakes up and he's at the breakfast table eating a cereal with his guitar on, right? <laughs> and I remember that because the guy yeah. loved to play guitar yeah. that much. Parents, if your kids are not waking up and loving the game, that's, hey, how about this? That's okay. That's okay. Let them pursue the passion that they want. If well, they don't, My kid doesn't have, he doesn't know what his passion is. It's okay. They're not going to know who they are until they're 30. None of us <laughs> do. And then you still reinvent yourself over and over again. I'm sorry. I'm saying a lot, Mark. I want to throw it back to you. But my point yeah. is, is that, that, that this changes when we stop focusing on, as Christy said, the golden puck, which if it's in your future, it's in your future. And start focusing on creating a better human being. That's the value of youth sports, creating a better human being. Because here's the deal. We all have to hang the skates up at some point. It's 18. It could be 40, but you got to hang them up and you got to work after that. Well, the good thing too, the good thing too, Lee, is that there is a, um, there's a learning curve for coaches too. Right. Um, as they get advanced, they, they learn the stuff to leave alone. And my favorite story this is the true story. My son was playing six-year-old hockey. The coach gets out a whiteboard. And starts talking to strategy on the bench. Great. Literally. He's, he's doing, I want you over here. I want one, blah, three, blah, blah. one. Yeah. He went on coach, for we only 10 have four minutes. players on the ice. Yeah. He went on for 10 minutes and he said, any questions? And my son was the first one to raise it. And I only knew this because he told me afterwards. He says, my son was the first one to raise his hand. And he said, okay, okay, Trevor, what's your question? Um, how many more days till Santa? <laughs> <laughs> right. I love it. Right. You That's know? it. And he said that was my last whiteboard discussion that season. I, I never did that again. Yeah, that it's fine perfect. at that age. It's fun. Yesterday, I had a player on the bench, uh, really upset, really emotional. And I turned to the coach who's, who's been coached at this level longer than me. I said, what's wrong with him? Why is he acting like that? He goes, he's eight. <laughs> <laughs> so I, was, I was like, thank you. I actually was like, you know what? Thank you. Thank you for reminding me that. That's a, I needed to hear that at that moment. Yeah, that's so one my, true. One of my 14 U kids just said that last weekend. I don't know if that's bad, but. But when, when's Santa coming? <laughs> some of the some of the coaches some of the coaches are funny too because they they realize we had a I, I pick on Czech coaches because we had one for a long time and um, he's just a he's a really interesting dude. I mean he um, his wife was the social person. He he didn't want to talk to parents or anybody else. But but I was on the board, so he had to talk to me. So he would come up and my son was playing for him, and he came up to me after a practice one time, and he says, "Mark, Mark, I have to talk to you about Trevor." And I said, what? He says, um, he's not back checking. So um, I have a choice there. You can talk to him or I can talk to him. What do you want to do? <laughs> and I said, I'll, I'll have no problem, Roman, talking about not talking to Trevor on my own. He says, okay, good. That's taken care of. And he walks away. <laughs> you know, it was 10. You know, it was 10. Shame on him for not back checking. <laughs> Like you know, it's not like checking. <laughs> so. Well, I, I want to reiterate again that at that young age, and 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 Mark, I want your take on this: is that look, the fundamentals, the skills, they will come. It's so much more important at the young age to cultivate a a love for the game that's got to be there for for a player to go any kind of distance, and then also life lessons: how to deal with adversity, you know, how to overcome obstacles in your way. The understanding that hey, if I work at something, there's nothing to do with hockey, right? If I work at something, I'll get better at it. That's what I'm trying to teach my son and the kids on this. Well, team. and teach values. I mean, values right. and morals and integrity. That's the value. And sportsmanship. And, and I'm going to give an example here. And I'm not going to, it's been in the news all week. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to name names or schools, but there is a, um, there is a kid right now who um, was arraigned in court yesterday. He's the captain of a division one hockey team. And he is just the, he got, he got arraigned for a third degree sexual assault. Hmm. And it's not the first time he's been charged. I have known this kid since he was six. I also know how he was raised by his father, which is hockey first, all the special schools, all the special training, all this. And you know what? He got him, he got him to a division one school. Good for you. But he forgot to teach something along the way. And that is not everything you come across is yours. 
you can't have everything you want. You have to have morals and integrity and standards. And this happens in hockey way too much. And, you know, watching this kid in an orange jumpsuit yesterday, because I, I watched it live on TV, it was just frightening to me. I was talking to my, um, I was talking to my son about it. who was friends with him growing up. And he says, I felt sick watching it. I just felt sick. And it's just, this is a, this is, and I'm not, I'm not saying that he wasn't taught morals and integrity, but I just know that 90% of his life growing up was hockey. Right. And nothing else mattered. Well, that's his identity, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. like and, and that, that's turned the conversation that way, right? Like it took me far too long in my life to realize that I don't have to play. I choose to play. Right. It took me a long time. Now, I was lucky enough. And I mean that fortunate enough that, you know, I have two very loving parents. And then when I realized that, which was really quite devastating, I'm not going to lie to you. It was freeing and devastating at the same time that I could lean back on my parents and I, was, I had a safe place to go. There are so many children out there in multiple sports that when they get out of the rink or off the field or out of school, they don't have a great place to go. Home can be hell for them. You know, and, and, and Mark, I want to share this with you. I've shared this on the show before. And I'm going to share this all the time. Um, one of the greatest things my father taught me and my mother taught me, and I do this with my own kid. My father used to say to me before every game, and this is, what, again, when I was on AAA all-star teams, when I was in college hockey, he said to me, I don't care what happens out there today. I'm going to love you no matter what when the game's over. That freed me to play so much better. I think so many parents fear saying something that's going to make my kids soft. It had the opposite effect for me. I played without fear most of the time because of that. I had no fear that I was going to get off the ice and be judged by my family because they didn't put in seven goals that game. Parents, I, I'm not criticizing anybody. We always say this is a judge, judgment-free zone on this show. Okay, we all make mistakes, including me. But my win every day, Mark, my win every day, whether it's a game or not, is when my kid goes to bed at night, he knows I love him and, and I know he loves me. That's my well, goal this, every day. This leads to my personal shame. Can I share my personal shame? Please share your personal Cause, shame. Because I, I am far from a perfect hockey dad and I have learned over the years uh, to, to not do things. Um, in, in one case, it was too late. Um, I was the worst car coach ever. Um, we had an analysis and a clinic on every drive home after every game from the time he was probably eight to the time he was 18. And I, it's just not good. I'll give you an example. Of, of, <laughs> so after a game one time, my wife walks up to me and says, I thought Trevor played really well today. I mean, he was, he was, he was hustling. He was blah, blah, blah. He was, he was probably 12. I think at this time he was doing all this, blah, blah, blah. And I said, you know what? He's on the wrong side of the rank half the time. He didn't cover his guys. He didn't come back. He was, he was cherry picking from the blue line, blah, blah, blah. And she looked at me and she said, I will take him home. <laughs> Good for her. It sounds like but that's it. Like, but I get yeah, a chance. I get a chance. To, I'm sorry, but I, I was just saying, I get a chance to apologize to my son last year. I, I sat him down and I said, I want to apologize for all the car coaching. And he's such a good kid. He says, you know what, dad, I probably wouldn't have been as good if you, if you didn't do it, but uh -huh. yeah, I could have used a little less of it. <laughs> you know, you know what's funny, Mark, yeah. is this, this episode is hot on the heels of an episode called the, the car is not for coaching. <laughs> oh, is it? <laughs> but, okay. Yeah. But I want to, I want to I wanna thank you real quick before I, Christy and Mike jump in. I just want to thank you for making yourself vulnerable there uh, and telling us that story because that that's really how we grow. And it's, it's stories like that have, that have made me a better coach. For my son, because I'm far from perfect too, right? I get I get anxiety on the bench sometimes. I gotta I gotta push it back down. But story, you saying things like that help people like me at the beginning of their youth hockey journey, and that's the point of the show. We're not sharing this information enough, right? And, and here's the thing: you're one of millions of coaches that do that to their kids, millions. But if we don't have the conversation, it's not going to change. Well, think about it when 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 your kids on the ice. You're watching everything. You're following him around the ice. You right. see everything. Camera, ISO cam. Everything he does. And the coach doesn't see any of this stuff. You know, they're looking at the flow. They're looking at whatever. So you're going to find stuff to nitpick. You're going to find stuff they don't do right. But what the first thing you need to ask your kid, to your point, Lee, when he gets in the car is, did you have fun? Right. And then go from there. You know, it just, or wait, or, or says people tell me all the time, just if, if you really want to evaluate and help your son, or your daughter become a better hockey player and you see things that maybe they should be doing, wait 24 hours and then tell them. Yeah, 24 hour you know, rule. Not in the car. 
I'm right. sorry. I'm sorry. I jumped on last week's topic, but it's just, no, no, no. We, I love that you did it. It affirms it's, that we it's my to personal shame. So I, 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 it's the one thing I, I regret more than anything. Well, it, not, let me ask you this, Mark. Does your, your son knows you love him though, right? Mm-hmm. Like I'm, I'm telling you as a son and a father, but as a son, uh, and, and look, look, we're all sons and daughters here, you know, knowing that as a parent and as a child back and forth, it, it's the ultimate thing, right? Like that's, that's where forgiveness comes in. It's like, he, he knows you meant the best. And, and here's the thing. He'll have kids one day. He'll probably make the same mistake or he'll learn from this mistake. That's the evolution of it. But I do appreciate you sharing it because that's what we need more of here. Uh, well, he, was so, yeah. he was so forgiving. I just, I, I literally had tears in my eyes. I was like, he was so right. forgiving. It's like, you know, don't worry about it, dad. It's, it's okay. You know, what you should do yeah. is let him follow you home from work and coach you in the car. <laughs> yeah, I thought that meeting today, dad, I didn't think that was that great. I think you need to do better with, no, go ahead. I'm sorry, Christy. <laughs> Well, I just want to give myself a shameless plug. I'll oh, do it. This do is the it. book. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and uh, Mark's chapter. I want to jump into this one. Um, he uh, he wrote a, a, this fantastic chapter, 83, the top things I change in youth hockey as a parent. Yeah. And he calls himself the commissioner of youth hockey, the parent commissioner of youth hockey. And one of the things you said, and I just laughed out loud when you said bad goalie parents. From <laughs> You know, some of my best friends are goalie. Some of my best friends are goalie parents, and that was kind of a thing to them. There are normal goalie parents out there. It's a small percentage. Yeah, both but there of are them. normal goalie. Yeah. Parents. And if you're listening to this right now, and you're a goalie parent, you think you're one of the normal ones, and you probably aren't. There you go. I, I, I can guarantee that we have goalie parents that listen to this show. To see. <laughs> Yeah, you raised some really good points in this chapter too. Also requiring financial balance sheet be given to parents at least twice a week. So important. I'm glad you brought that up. Let's talk about that. There have been so many scandals over the years. I remember there was a very, um, there was an infamous case in Ann Arbor, Ann Arbor, Michigan, probably like 10 years ago, where somebody walked away with hundreds of thousands of dollars and nobody noticed over like a two and three year period. And she ended up in jail, but she was the quote unquote treasurer of the hockey association. And money wasn't going where it was supposed to. And just because no one ever asked for a balance sheet. And if you're on it, this is my thing. If you're on a team and you ask for a financial statement and they push back, like you don't deserve that, find another team to go play on because that should be an automatic. I'm going to let you know what's going on financially in this, with this team. And this is, this is, this is how much money's out. This is where this money went. This is how much this tournament costs, whatever. This is how much ice is costing us. You know, there's got to be a financial balance sheet. If, if there isn't, go find another team to play on because there's something wrong there. And Mark, Mike, since you're in it now, um, what do your teams do? And, and I've seen it, you know, not just with hockey, but even with other sports organizations where um, treasurers or people who are in charge of the financial, the balance sheet, take advantage of that. And we've seen some prosecutions locally here in the central New York area too. Um, and sometimes parents uh, on teams that, you know, we've been a part of, have questioned, where's the money going? They, <laughs> they raised some eyebrows and never really got answers. So what do, what do your teams do to make sure that parents um, know how money is being spent? Yeah, so all the organizations I work with the last, probably the last 10 years now, you know, from a, from a hockey director, administrator point of view, is I require them to have uh, at par- as part of their parents' guide. So when you send out your parents' guide to your youth hockey team or your organization, that there is a breakdown and I, what I try to do is get organizations to use that in a positive way, because I want them to really see that by together, the parents money that's going into the program is actually providing more, uh, you know, the oversight's there, but it's providing more opportunity for the kids to get more things. Like if we broke down how much it costs to go to a tournament and we will show those things. Okay. If we all go to a tournament, it's going to cost us collectively about Fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars, right? To go to that tournament as a group, we could take that money and put it towards this. Here's what ice time costs. Here's what coaching costs. Here's what, and guess what we could get out of this if we did it a different way. So I think once parents can understand, like I, and I probably do it a little differently than most organizations because I mean it's probably why I work with so many organizations is because I save them money and I find ways to say, okay, well, we're all going to buy tape together. We're all going to buy, you know hockey wraparounds together. We're all going to buy ice time together. We're all going to get that skating coach and split the cost. So now instead of people, you know, feeling like where is like, and I think you need to show value. If you listen, if you're going to pay your coaches $12,000 a year, $8,000 a year, $10,000, $20,000 a year, just there's no reason to hide that. 
I mean, if you're an organization that says we value this check coach and we're going to pay him $12,000 a year to coach your kid, this is why your fees cost this much money. It's when you start hiding the fees and the costs is the first, that's the biggest red, like to Mark's point, that's the biggest red flag I would ask. Like, well, what are they going towards? And if, the, if your organization can't answer that, like within seconds, especially this day and age, like in seconds of sending you, like I, I'm, I run our lacrosse organization. I'm like, this is why we're able to keep things so cheap because we're not paying, uh, you know, coaches. So if we do understand that everything, that like all those fees go up because there is, you know, the, the money, it just doesn't come from nowhere. It has to come from the parents. You know, what's um, funny, you know, what's funny too, is the kids, the kids have their own ideas on where the money should be spent too. <laughs> and it's, right. so if, if, so if I, I will guarantee you, if you walk in a locker room and you say, okay, kids, here's my choice. I can spend X amount of money on a tournament and so-and-so next month, or I can get, we can get you guys really nice sweats. <laughs> They're yeah. going to take the sweats, you know, They're gonna go. that's fine. I'm going to skip that tournament because that we need new sweats. You know? we, we, did we, that, we did that. We did that with a group uh, at the end of last year. They could, they could go to one more meaningless tournament, but they went, had gone to six or they could pull the money and every kid in the organ, every kid on the team, because they collectively bought, got a brand new pair of skates brand new pair wow. i mean you're talking about six seven hundred dollar pair of skates that's a no every kid on the team and every parent's like well why would why don't we always do that i go you you tell me why you don't do that all the time like like my so my philosophy on this is especially go so mark you're in you're in an organization in south carolina you're in you're, you have your own rank you have your own fees you have your own expenses why is it why do we want to get our customers to spend money in somebody else's rank as soon as possible as opposed to spending their money in our ring. I, it just baffles my mind why we do that. But I think a lot of it has to do with, well, what are we giving them then? If they're gonna stay in our rink and they're gonna stay in our program and stay local, what can we do to make it a better experience than getting into Tahoe, spending money at mobile, staying at the Marriott and getting 45 minutes of total ice time over the weekend. But if we don't show those things, if we can't show those in that spreadsheet, like this is what you're getting in return of this, then I can see why people need to get on a plane and go to a tournament. But if we can show them the other way, and to your point, Mark, if you could, if you went in there and said, okay, guys, girls, this is what our options are. You know, 18 minutes of ice or a weekend amusement park team building activity. They're never choosing the ice. They're never, ever, ever choosing the ice. They just aren't. Mom and dad might be, but maybe they just want to get all ripped up, you know, at the Marriott and, uh, you know, at two o'clock in the morning. But I think it's just, I think it's more of a, ask the kids, see what they want to do. And, and again, I'm not a non-believer in tournaments and we've had these conversation on, on our episodes a lot, uh, but I'm more about, you know, wh why aren't we listening to the kids more and why aren't we giving them an opportunity just to contribute to what, you know, we should be spending our money on. Yeah. You could spend hours just talking about tournaments. I mean, so we did. Yeah, we, we have, have. yeah, oh, <laughs> we, and we only tape a little bit of it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, no, but you're yeah. right though. That's a that's a great point. I mean, that maybe that's something that should go out immediately. Ask for your spreadsheet, right? Demand it and get it. If you don't Mike, get it, Mike, get out. I want to plug you just real quick, and then Chris, I'll throw it to you. It, it, one of the things that makes Mike so great, and one of the reasons why I'm so honored to share this mic with you every week is. Mike, Mike has realized a few things in his line of work. One is that he just loves being a coach, even when it's frustrating, Mike, for you. You just love the game. You love coaching. You love, you love molding minds. But here's the other thing, too. When you look at organizational financials and stuff like that, I think what happens a lot of time is these people running, running organizations, not always entrepreneurs, they're not always business owners. You know, their parents that volunteered have moved up the ranks. And, you know, someone said, oh, this is how we do it. This is how we do it. This is how we do it. And, Mike, you kind of bring that critical business thinking to it. Um, of, hey, why, why don't we contact these people? Why don't we look for bulk deals? Um, and, and that's why you're so valuable, Mike, because you're, you know, Mike, I'm going to plug you, Mike Benelli Hockey Solutions. There's a reason that exists. It's because it, he's going to save the money for, for the organization because he's been there. Um, anyway, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to turn it this into No, no, I, I appreciate that. And it's not yeah, only just about, I think, to Mark's point, though, it's not just yeah. about saving money. It's about right. retention. If you're exactly. in South Carolina, you need to retrain, retain any kid that has a glimmer of wanting to play hockey. Right. You've got to get them all. So how do you do it? Well, you do it by giving them greatest value. And I Absolutely. think the greatest value, I know yeah. it's, I know it's cliche, but the greatest value is a kid smiling at the rink. It, that is not, the greatest value. That shouldn't be cliche. That's, that's what Mark's oh, all, I know that. that. that shouldn't but be but you know what, you know what yeah. works too, is that when you have, like, I, I have friends of mine who had a bunch of kids play hockey in Nashville. They have such a great relationship in Nashville with the Predators who do so much yeah. for those youth teams out there. And it's the same thing where, where we, I, I live in Greenville. 
Um, we have the the Greenville Swamp Rabbits, and which is an e- <laughs> which which. Which is an which is an ECHL team. Oh, that sounds like an ECHL team. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's a great rabbit. it's a great logo. Yeah, it's a great logo. That is a great logo. It is a great logo. It is a great logo. logo. You got to go there to find out, Kristen. Yeah. yeah, but they um, but they you know we we work on a regular basis to make sure those kids come out and they skate with us. They get to go to games. They get to get recognized on the scoreboard when they're player of the month. I mean, there's all sorts of things you can do to keep the fun in it. Yeah. And these kids, these kids don't know. I mean, they're in South Carolina. Most of them, they don't know who pro hockey players are for the most part. You know, when they see somebody from the Swap Rabbits come in, whoa, can I have your autograph? Can I, you know? Yeah. It, never mind, he's a 40-year-old journeyman defenseman. Who's <laughs> but uh, <laughs> dream is alive. I want to see that mascot. I want to see a Swamp Rabbit mascot. <laughs> well, not, yeah, there's a Swamp Rabbit mascot. He's, 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 like, he's, Another he's episode. Like a crazy bunny is what he is. He's just a crazy bunny. That's so cool. Yeah. Um, Keeping with the chapter that he wrote, which is a really great chapter about the things that you would change um, if you could in youth hockey. I love what you wrote here. Um, requiring coaches to talk to parents. You've been seeing this in dealing with years and what other sports do coaches decide they don't have to communicate with parents of kids as young as eight. Um, I do see that as a problem. That line of communication is so important, especially when your kids are just starting out in hockey. And you, you may not know a lot about hockey, as I was. Like, I was clueless about the sport. Um, and that line of communication is so important to help me as a parent understand it and help me develop my child, right? With a double-edged sword, because who created that situation? Crazy parents. So <laughs> that's, that's how that's it happens. true. You know, yeah. so I think it, on both sides, parents have to chill. And at the same time, coaches need to be, I had a coach one time that just read the riot act one time in a locker room and it was, it was eight year olds and um, just about how crazy the parents were and said, you know, I don't want to talk to any of you anymore and gave instances. And we all looked at each other going, who was doing this? You know, we're looking around the room going, no, it's just, it was crazy. Some of they wanting private meetings about their kids ice time and they want blah, blah, blah. And it was, it was a ridiculous situation. So I understand it, but at the same time, if you lay out the ground rules early on in the season, and, and you have that communication. You say, listen, this is what I don't want. Don't talk to me about ice time. Don't talk to me about, um, you know, about kids and, and our concussion protocol. Here's, here's what our protocol is. Here's what we're going to do. Don't talk to me. You know, don't talk to me about um, the fact that you, you're playing four sports right now and you can't show up for practice. You know, we'll work that out ahead of time. Mike, you know that one. We don't yeah. need to have private <laughs> meetings. And I told Christy this too. I was like, when we, we had worked on an article for USA hockey magazine about, you know, playing multiple sports after the season, you know, and I was telling her that, you know, we had baseball coaches that would tell, ask my kids first question, do you play hockey? Cause they didn't want the hockey players because they knew they weren't going to be around for practices because they had off ice training and all this stuff all year long. And it's just, it's very difficult, but coaches have got to lay coaches have no one to blame, but themselves if they don't lay the ground rules at the beginning of the season, I agree. They're going to get the parents in the room and say, rather than watching a video, which is usually what happens, the coaches need to go in there personally and say, this is my personal, um, this is my personal, uh, you know, it's not an ultimatum, but my, my rules on, yeah. on what I expect from parents this season and this is what this is what I expect you to do. And when you violate that, uh, I'm going to cut off communication. Go ahead. I mean, you, you've warned them, right? But for, for coaches, they go, I don't talk to parents. Like, that's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. Parents are paying your bills. You know, you got to talk to them. College and up is the first time you can do that, coaches, in my opinion. Once you get to college, you have a little bit more of a stay with that. But I, I agree with you. Mark. Even, at the ju- even at the junior yeah. level. I mean, yeah. we, uh, my coaches talk to parents all the time. You know, right. it's just. You're paying a lot of money, you know, to pay. Well, I, I think what you said is true. You got to establish those standards immediately at the start. You can't wait till halfway through. You can't wait till the problems rise up. Um, that's when you have to do it. Listen, we only have a few minutes left. So I wanted to ask this question because I always like to give our audience some actionable items. And uh, Mark and Mike, you could probably tackle this. I, I know you have a role in the, in the, the Greenville organization right now. And just want to ask, you know, have you, impl- with everything you've learned, everything you've done, have you implemented anything that's different, that's working? Um, you know, within your organization and, or if, if we can't go that route, let's talk about showcases and AAA things, AAA uh, uh, showcases and, you know, what, to, what to really look at before you dive in um, because it's, you know, parents blindly throw money at these. Oh, it says AAA, I'm going to it. Right. So, so just, you're, you know, kind of parting ways here, just last few, like, Hey, here's my, my tips for you guys. Um, 
I think there are a number of organizations and I'm, I'm not going to name names, but there are a number of organizations that like to cherry pick talent out of local associations and wreck the fiber of the association. Again, going back to kids playing together, right. Um, who promise these kids the moon for $10,000 a year or whatever it's going to cost them. And it's just not, it's not right. I mean, if your kids, it's kind of like baseball. My, I, I worked in baseball for a lot of years. My kids played college baseball. I, I know baseball as well as I know hockey. And baseball, you'd always see these new teams show up every year, um, led by coaches whose kids couldn't make another team, so they started their own. Right. <laughs> you know, right. there's not as much of that in hockey because it's much more difficult to do that. But at the same time, there's there's all this cherry picking that's going on and pulling kids out of associations and out of high schools. And you know, we've lost in a lot of other outside of Minnesota and some others, maybe a few other states, we've lost the magic of high school hockey because they're all playing triple A. And it's just, it, I, I just think it's great for these kids to go to school together and play. So I, my, my thinking is let's, let's make your association as much fun as possible. And if the parents want to go pay a bunch of money for some, you know, super travel team with great uniforms that want to cherry pick people, let them go. They'll be back because they'll understand how they'll understand right. how bad things. And it happens a lot. There's a boomerang factor when they go to these, when they go to these teams and realize it's not all it's cracked up to be. Mike, do you have any thoughts on that too? I just want to make sure I give you a minute for that one. I know you have thoughts on it as well. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I do, but I mean, I, but again, that's, I mean, that's basically how I've, I've kind of like carved out a niche, right. With, with groups, because I think I, I have those answers. I mean, I can bring in and, and, and make sure that, you know, organizations can uh, organically grow and keep their, and keep their talent, but keep their really good families. Yeah. And knowing that you're going to lose families, you're going to lose 10% of your kids. Uh, listen, I have, I, I think, I commute, there's no doubt about, about it that I communicate more than any coach that I know that I work with, that I work for, that I've worked against. No doubt about it. And I'm miserable on Mondays with the emails. I mean, I can't even believe the level of audacity of parents to re to, the way they reach out and the way they demand. But I think to Mark's point, a lot of it has to do with the fact that there is no repercussions. They can just get up and go anywhere they want. And, and, they, and there's plenty of people that will listen to them to do that. Right. So it's, it's, it's very like, oh, you, you can't like that situation. It's a horrible situation. <laughs> oh, well, you want to leave? Yeah, I'll leave. OK, good. Take five kids with you. But what I try to do with the, with the youth organizations is to, to mark, I love that the term is you just make it so much fun and so rewarding to come into the rink that even if you lose those one or two kids, you're probably going to get a couple back. But really, right. the more important piece is to focus on the ones that want to stay. And I think if you do that and you can, and you have strength in numbers, right? You don't worry. I think it's the small organizations that lose those one or two kids. And all of a sudden the domino effect is now you lose the third and fourth kid. Cause they think they're the one and two kid. And then all of a sudden the level goes to the place where you don't have a team anymore. Right. And that happens all across the country everywhere. And um, you yeah, know that we got to fix that. But I think the biggest, the biggest part is run a good organization with great returns as far as, you know, what you do with your, your families. And you're going to retain more people. And I think, and the last thing I would say is get more people involved. If you isolate yourself, Mark, I'm sure you don't run your organization by yourself. Get more people involved, get everyone helping, get everybody, you know, I, I call it, like I joke around about it. Like the more parents I can get helping me do certain things within a team, the more, the, the less the ship's going to sink. Because right. if the ship's sinking, we all did it. As opposed to like, oh, that guy did it. And I think it's just important. And, and most of the time it doesn't happen that way because you have more people that are, that are contributing to your success. But well, yeah, uh, you, know, you know what should happen? We should have, I mean, I think it would be good to have, there's always a, maybe one, two bad coaches in the mix that kind of drive people away. Um, and it's hard to do coaching evaluations because it's hard to find coaches. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. we, had, I'll give you, I just want to share this story with you. So we had, I was at a, um, I was in, uh, it was in Michigan and it was a, it was a, it was a league that my son was playing in and we had like 15, 16 coaches. So we decided to do applications for all these coaches. And this one coach had to fill out an application who had coached for 10 years and he just resented it. So <laughs> under the category of hockey philosophy, he put down dump and chase. And then we put on the foil. That was his response. <laughs> that response alone made me want to hire him, but <laughs> <laughs> It was just really, it was, I mean, some of these coaches shouldn't be coaching, but because there's such a lack of volunteers, right. 
you know, what are you going to do? You, know, well, you, I, you said, you said it earlier, Mark. I mean, we were laughing about, you know, this, this level five status, you know, which means nothing to me. There's there, I, I could, I could list five pages of level five coaches that I've trained that I would never let around my kids ever. <laughs> and, 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 and again, it's not the, it's not the level of coaching. And I think conversely, we have so many good people. We can't get into coaching because of what we're asking them to do, you know, all this other paperwork and this and that, and 12 hours of training and, th- and the abuse, really good and the people. abuse. And, and the abuse, and, and again, yeah. the abuse though is, and I, I hate, I hate using like, well, that just goes with the territory. Like my wife can't understand. Like she looks at me and like, how do you deal with this every day? Like how, how, like what? Cause she, cause the, 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 your, your family knows what you do to prepare to work with 18 other families, kids. Right. And then they're like, why are you like, what well. joy can come from this? <laughs> and I'm like, no, you're right. You know, it takes a, it, 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 well, sometimes it takes you just a, need the association or the board or somebody yeah, supporting you. Yeah, yeah. But like, I, used to, I used to go to tournaments in, in Michigan when I was with uh, Michigan Amateur Hockey Association. We'd be, I'd be running tournaments and I would look in the stands and I would go, you out, you out, <laughs> you out. That was, I would spend my whole day doing that because they're just being a, <laughs> coaches, and, coaches and referees. You know, it's just like somebody's got to right. do that. It shouldn't be the coaches. Well, my friends, we are out of time. I will say this to the audience that probably doesn't know this and you'll laugh about this. We record these episodes Monday morning for a reason, Mike, and it's because it's therapy. <laughs> it's therapy for all of us. No, it, just for those you don't know, we do record the show every Monday. And Mike, Christy, and I always say, Mark, it's, it's, it's always good to start the week with this because pretty charged up from the weekend most times, but that's, that's why. So, uh, Mark, you've been a uh, phenomenal guest. We could, we could go for another hour, but, but our time's up. So thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, that's going to do it. Can I give one shout out? Please, yeah. Yeah, please. Greenville High School went undefeated this year and won the, won the state championship yesterday, and they're going to nationals in Dallas. That's so awesome. Congratulations that's to good. Greenville High School. That, that's an accomplishment. Yeah, that, that's the thing. That, those kids will remember that. That's what they'll remember probably for the rest of their lives. And these kids have grown up together, and they, they, they've known each other since they were. And the teams right. they are playing against, they all knew because they, they're on a lot of teams here. So they right. play each other a hundred times. So they all, it's like buddies playing buddies. It's, it was an awesome, it was in Charleston this weekend. It was just an awesome event. So that's no, great. I saw that. I'm glad you shouted that out. And it just goes to show you, look, look the, that dream, that side of the dream is still alive, right? It, it, it is out there if you want to find it. I love it. So uh, that's going to do it for this episode of Our Kids Play Hockey. Remember, you can listen to all of the episodes, every single one of them at ourkidsplayhockey.com or wherever you listen to your podcast. Make sure to like and subscribe if you got value out of this. Uh, For Mark Gilman, Mike Vanelli, and Christy Casciano Burns, I'm Lee Elias. We're going to see you on the next edition of Our Kids Play Hockey. Have a great week, everybody. We hope you enjoyed this edition of Our Kids Play Hockey. Make sure to like and subscribe right now if you found value wherever you're listening, whether it's a podcast network, a social media network, or our website, ourkidsplayhockey.com. Also, make sure to check out our children's book, When Hockey Stops, at whenhockeystops.com. It's a book that helps children deal with adversity in the game and in life. We're very proud of it. But thanks so much for listening to this edition of Our Kids Play Hockey, and we'll see you on the next episode.